I'm still having a hard time with what he says. You fall asleep also? No, I don't fall asleep. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what, in fact, what he the said, speech. what it meant. Now, now there's a book that I bought a long time ago. I used to write a book, rocks. and it's called, yeah, the pain, you know, the name it's by Eckhart Tolle. What's the name of that book again? Yeah. Uh, he talks DVDs. about all the time. Oh, gosh. You know which one I'm talking about. I can't think of the uh, name. Uh, anyway, there's a book. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was telling her about a book. I don't think. I'll have to try. Maybe he didn't. Put a block on it. Maybe I can make a duplicate. Usually, it's a shadow. You recall that? But you know, sometimes when something you know, mm -hmm. movies and stuff. Someone tried to start it too much. I'll, uh, I'll check. You know, that. just a well, moment ago, dead. I turned it on. I recorded it all. So we all have a million I Okay. Well, um, welcome back, gone. everybody. Um, I'll say welcome back to the other one. <laughs> he wants to do it. We missed you. Yeah, well, I missed you all. I tried to get, uh, we, we went up there, uh, some, some to, yeah, her, her, my daughter performed, my, my daughter is an understudy for the leading actress, there's only two people in this play on Broadway. Wow. At the uh, Ballet's Velasco Theater, which is a hundred year old theater wow. on Broadway. And so the play is, uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It won three, won four Tonys. And it's a rock musical. And uh, uh, Neil Patrick Harris played Hedwig. Uh, did you all remember seeing, or did you ever see the Rocky Horror Show? Oh, yeah. On Back in the 70s, 80s, I'm in the it was a uh, cult. Right. I remember going to it and everybody would come with umbrellas and, and lights, and it was an interactive yeah. play with a rock musical, uh, and everybody knew the lines, so the audience would repeat the lines. <laughs> you know, so it was like, it, just, it was a cult film, it was beautiful. But it was a rock musical. And so this is a, this is a, a Hedwig and the Angry Inch is a rock musical. Um, but it's based on the Plato, Plato's myth about the origin of humanity. And the origin of humanity in Plato's myth was that the original human had four arms and four legs. And it's very powerful. And the gods, got, the gods got jealous. And they went to Zeus and said, Zeus, so we're really threatened by this very powerful human, so when you fix it, so he split man into two, like splitting one into twins, who are now eternally looking for themselves. <laughs> so man goes through life looking for his other half, you see. Whether it's male looking for female or female looking for male, but since it can be transgender, it's more of uh, looking for your soulmate. And the, and the soulmate, you, you know your soulmate when you look into their eyes. It's like you know the soulmate, whether they're whatever they are, male, female, you know, whatever sex or gender, whatever, this, it's in the eyes. So the story is of Hedwig and the Angry Inch is based on this original unity being broken, and now he is trying to find his wholeness again, and, he, and so this, the search for wholeness takes place in, in the world. In other words, uh, did y'all see the movie Hurt Locker? Well, y'all won't get out. <laughs> it won an Oscar a few years ago. In fact, it beat out, this really not pissed, pissed me off, because it, it beat out Avatar for this picture. And I thought Avatar was the best picture ever. Hurt, but, but and that's another story. <laughs> so the play, the the, the uh, Cedric and the Angry Inch opens on a stage set that looks like the Hurt Locker, where they have uh, pieces of metal in a blown up car. It looks like a, uh, a Detroit, you know, like a like a broken, present day, a broken place, you know, a Hurt Locker. That's what a hurt, you know, a place of pain. You know, you know, every fragment floated hanging in the air. You know, an old abandoned car, everything is broken. Buildings coming down, you know, like, you know, like uh, 
like Syria, you know, that kind of, you know, like, like a place that's a war zone. You know? So it takes place in that. So the whole play is basically Hedwig, and there's a rock, there's a band on, there's a rock band on stage, the play, and he's giving a performance to the people who are coming into the play, you see. So it's kind of like a real, pretend real performance. I'm glad you're here. And he's relating to the audience as if they were watching the regular Rocky Horror Rock Show. Uh, his basic story is that he was a uh, in Eastern Europe, East Berlin, which was a divided city, and uh, he was divided because he was gay, and he could not, did not know what he was, he didn't know who he's, what he was going to do, and he <coughs> fell in love with an American soldier who said. You could, if we could get married, I could get you out of here. We can go to America. But the East Berlin would not recognize gay marriage, same-sex marriage. So he had to get a, uh, a, sexual, uh, uh, an op a sex operation to change his sex to female so he could get married and get out of East Berlin. So this was his ticket to homeless. <laughs> So he has the sex change operation, but being in East Berlin, they botched it, you see, and left him with half male and half female, so he had an angry itch. <laughs> so, so, so he's not, now he's not either. He can't be female or male, and he's just angry. <laughs> and so they you get married, they come to the United States, and the soldier leaves him. And so he's looking for his soulmate, and he sees the soulmate in this young man called Tommy Gnosis. Uh, that was what he named him. So he falls in love with his soulmate, Tommy Gnosis. They become very creative and write all this rock music. And uh, then Tommy Gnosis leaves him and becomes famous using the music that they wrote. And, and Hedwig is now angry again, and he's playing in shopping malls. You know, in other words, he's, and Tommy Gnosis is off there in the stadium, you know, pulling, you know, it's just, just angry. So he goes through, he's just eaten up with this anger, uh, the pain of not having wholeness, and so he goes through a personal gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge. Mm -hmm. Gnostic religion was the knowledge of God, unity of God, knowledge of God is unity, of wholeness. So this so he's looking for his own knowledge of unity. So he goes through a breakdown and uh, comes out the smoke and he disappears and he comes back as as so the whole Hedwig is dressed in wigs, you see, the female dress. He's, he is a, 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 a drag queen, you know, he's dressed in uh, which is what rock star is all about, is that androgynous, you know, they don't feel so he's uh, going through that, and then he has gnosis, and the smoke clears, and he's in a, and he's a male again. You see, so he's so he's like he's achieved. Uh, not that he got. It's not so much. It's more on a metaphysical level, a metaphorical level than actual biological level. But he, he becomes whole. His part, the, his partner, which my daughter played. His, uh, that, that person's name is, uh, that character's name is uh, Ixoc. So Hedwig meets Ixoc in Czechoslovakia or some eastern country. And, and, and uh, Ixoc is, the, uh, dra is a transgressor. Right? He dresses to, he's a male who performs as a female. So Hedwig says, well, I'll marry you and get you out of here, but you have to give up something. This whole thing is about having to give up something for homeless. It's like, he had to give up his uh, penis or his sex for wholeness, the promise of wholeness, and his watch, you see. So this whole idea that runs through this is sacrifice. Do I have to give up something to be me? Do I have to give up something to be whole, you see? Uh, what's the, what sacrifice do I have to give up? So Hedwig says to Ixoc, well, if you give up, you can never, you can, we'll get married, come back, and you'll be in my band, but you can never wear a wig. I mean, you can't be who you want to be, you have to be my gopher. So Hedwig, so Ixoc kind of like plays a male. So my daughter's playing a male. And she, 
when, when, we, when she first got the part, she takes out her iPhone and says, uh, oh, who is this? And I had uh, no idea. Nicholas Cage, I didn't know who it was. <laughs> she said, it's me. So she, put, she had fixed her to, to audition for the part. She came up with her own makeup, makeup and made herself up into a man and went to the tryout, you know, dressed as a man. Huh? Yeah, well, yeah, so well, the way the play ends, you see, is that through the whole play, Ixoc is repressed. Can't be oh, who I am, you see. Boom! It's like, okay, and he's angry, and Ixoc is always angry with Hedwig, because Hedwig, but you put that down, you idiot, you know, that kind of repression, you know. Go get some, go get my water. You know, so, but, but uh, Ixoc would sing as backup, but never leave, you see. He's, couldn't put on the wing. So when, so when Hedwig has his gnosis, he looks at Ixoc and says, you can put on the wig. So Ixoc goes off the stage and comes back to Shannon. So it's really neat, you know. So she comes back and goes on stage and just lets it out, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm born again, I'm realized, you know, I'm whole, you know, I'm here on stage. And so that, that performance, she just lets out the stops, you know, and um, it's very powerful. So uh, to me, this was, I see, I see metaphors everywhere. <laughs> so the play uh, is kind of like a metaphor for my daughter's life in that she had a dream since a little girl when she was in her first high school, first school play, Snow White, to be on the stage and of course then on Broadway. So, and also to be a rock star. And so she's achieved that dream, and she is the uh, lead singer in Led Zeppelin, which is a tribute band for Led Zeppelin. And they sing all over the country and in Europe. So she is a wow. rock star wow. singer. But to be on Broadway, she's she, she not really she's not really a theater actor. She's a you know a musical actor. So this so this was her opportunity, uh, and she. Uh, uh, took her months, you know, they, they spent a lot of time casting these things, you know, so she finally got it. And, uh, but the whole, the whole life, you know, so to see, you know, this idea of being, having to pay your dues, you know, she had to pay her dues, you had to spend the time sticking with your dream, paying the dues, being the understudy, being, Rejected, you know, not getting it, not flying the kite, you know. Charlie the tuna, not quite ready to get in the tuna factory yet, you know, like, the whole thing, you know. And so then when it, so it's kind of like the play was a metaphor for her uh, coming out, you know. So who knows where it may not lead to anything else or anything, who knows? But that, that's not important. The point is that uh, it was just a very popular experience for her, so. At that time, well, the play got four. Uh, Lena Hall, who was the actress, she was understudy for got a Tony, and uh, Neil Patrick Harris got a Tony, and then the play got Best Rock Musical, and then some other award. Um, so uh, anyway, it's um, it's a very uh, uh, it's not a long play. I think it's just a, a little over an hour, and then, you know, it's not, because it's. Hedwig is on stage for the whole thing. It's no great. It's just full blast for the whole thing. Don't you think that's true in all phases of life? You have to go through this of some sort to come Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that's the reason you're putting this on the that's floor. Why we're, right? That's why we're in this. That's why I'm here anyway. Yeah. But I think that's why you're here is that, uh, you know, we've all been paid the dues in life. Um, we've all done the jobs, what we've been required. We've all had the families and the jobs and the, the whole thing, the careers. And now what? You know, what what like are we now? We're, we're that that rocking chair and watch soap <laughs> operas for the, you know, until I die? Is that it? <laughs> some people don't seem to have to go through as much brokenness as others. You know, I know some people just seem like this is failing. All the way. Now, maybe you don't know or you're not aware of it, but it just seems like it's just. Well, the, it's the, bigger, the bigger the break, the bigger the breakdown, the, the bigger the payoff. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, 
I don't know. Everybody has their own story. Um, so anyway, the um, <coughs> yeah. So I, you know, as, as I'm just talking about this play now, uh, just to you, it, it keeps it's kind of like uh, uh, per something percolating. I see more meaning in it, you know, all the time. Uh, <coughs> But this, this, this idea of um, uniting opposites to create a whole um, you could say these are, well this Yoga Nidra yes. is about, does this, and it shows you how to do it in yourself, because first you're working with body sensations, and you you feel uh, energy in your left side, and then your right side. Now put them together, or working with uh, breath. You feel the breath on your left side, and then the right side. Now feel the breath as one. Or feel what I want to do today is the section on feelings. So you're feeling a warm feeling and then a cool feeling and then put them together. Uh, what what this is doing, yes? Uh, I was rubbing the lady's back and she said, why does this feel so good? And I got into mind and body and I was lost. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about that? Why does somebody massaging your why does it feel so good in your body? I guess it feels good in your mind. So I was struggling. Explain that. Uh, you were on the body by a Yeah. Um, body is, body is, there's only one body in the sense that uh, Everything is interrelated. Like there's only one Earth, right? But all these bodies are on the Earth, and yet you can't abstract anything from the Earth and put it out there. You can't take the fish out of the water, and it won't be a fish. So the water is fish with fins. In other words, the, the object is part of the background, and you can't separate the two except in the moment. So I can separate my mind can separate my thinking about something. I, I can think about this marker as being separate from this room, but it really isn't. It's part of this room. There's no way for this to be abstracted as a thing from the room. So uh, we can imagine it. But that's not what's happened. We can't be we can't be taken out of the water of our body. So the body is really one reality that our mind separates into this body and this body and this hand and this and that, you see. So that is the fragmented world here, you see. We live in a world that's been busted, like if you take a cup and smash it into a billion pieces, you see. What we experience in the world is fragmented, a bunch of objects running around bumping into each other, and it's painful, you see? But there is an original oneness that we cannot be conscious of, because if you're conscious of something as an object, there has got to be not the object. So, if I keep this thing open, I'll dry up. So here you have a circle, right? So that's an object. But this is the, the inside. And this line here, which is its definition, its boundary, makes an object. And I can see that. But this object depends upon, for its existence, depends upon the outside. Without the outside, there is no inside. So these are, the whole is the outside and the inside is one, but our consciousness only perceives things. 
function of consciousness that sees things separate from other things is a survival mechanism. I mean, you run from tigers and catch a bus and make stuff. But it is not, but it does not give us gnosis of the whole. We only have consciousness of the parts. So when our heart knows gnosis. <laughs> so our heart yearns for the whole, but the conscious mind can't find it, find it because it's looking around in the broken pieces. See? You can't be conscious of the whole because if whatever you're conscious of is going to have a boundary around it and an outside that you're not conscious of. So the consciousness cannot know the outside and the inside because there's no boundary in that. There has to, for you to know something, there has to be a boundary. In other words, you have to be able to name it. I know this because it's a marker. Because I just named it, <laughs> and it's a marker, and it's, and it's not these keys. Right? So this is a marker, that's a cup, that's a phone, there's keys. So all of these are, are the way we walk around in this world because we name stuff. But it's a fragmented world. So this longing for unity uh, wants to be satisfied. And the illusion is that we look for wholeness in the parts. So that's people say you're looking for God in the wrong place. Or you're looking for you're looking for the formless whole in form in things. So you're looking for that which is beyond things in other things. And you can't do it. So that's what life is going through one discovery, one realization after another that I thought this was it, I thought this person was it, I thought this job was it, I thought this family was it, but it wasn't. So there's some gnosis keeps driving us, you see, through our dramas till we get to the point where we begin to ask the question, well maybe I'm looking the wrong way. See, maybe I'm asking the wrong question or looking the wrong way, you see. And that's the beginning of the spiritual path. When you begin to question the world's way of finding wholeness in things or careers or other people. So now this search begins to go within instead of without. There's a flip. And that's why the second half of life is so valuable, because this is the life, this is the, this is the half of life, where we have the time and the wisdom to, and the incentive to turn within, because death gets closer. In the first half of life, you've got plenty of time. <laughs> you know, you've got, but the second half of life, you, you hear the clock ticking. <laughs> you know? You know, every year, you know, I've got less time. So where is the timeless? You see, time, the, the whole is not in time. It's timeless. And where is timeless but now? So uh, Errol and I were talking about this, this today. Uh, we have great discussions before class. And, uh, so it's this. Well, even religion, you see, religion is in this quest too, like you're in the world, or the fragmented world, or the sinful world, or whatever you want to call it, and you want to get to being reborn, or salvation, or heaven, or whatever, but it's in time. It's tomorrow. Right now is hell. But we want to get to heaven, which is either going to be when I get the job, or when I get reborn, or when I get Jesus, or, or giving that up, when I get to heaven, I'll get hold, as you see. But the, the common factor in it is it's in time. So it's always tomorrow. But Gnosis, or the timeless, is only now. I mean, whatever, when you get to tomorrow, it's still now. If we're always now. We can, I can think about tomorrow, but when I get tomorrow, I mean, it's always, I'm still now. 
you see, so I'm never getting out of now. <laughs> if I live 300 years, it's always going to be just right now. I can think about tomorrow in the past, but I'm always now. So you always have now, future, past. Um, so now is timeless. And there is no time right There's no time in now. There's only time when I think about it. Look at how long is this class going to last? See, so how much more time is it that that's thinking about? So time doesn't come in until we start thinking. So time and thinking are right. If we're not thinking, which is what happens when we're having a good, you know, right there, having, we're having a good time, that means when you're having no time. When you're dancing or making love or doing something very exciting or meeting an old friend or, oh my goodness, you know, you're, you're now. And then you might start thinking about, as soon as you start thinking, oh, am I having a good time now? You stop having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as soon as you come thinking about, you know, most people say, I had no idea we were here so much time. Or you go to a class and suddenly the class is over. You say, my God, you know, it went by like that. Say, well, if you're bored in the class, it'll take a long time for the class to get over. Oh my God, I've got five more minutes. I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> or it goes by like this. Meditation is like this. Your meditation is playing with time. So you sit for meditation. So I'm going to sit. You have an intention. Set your clock. 20 minutes. You sit. Thinking comes in and says, what time is it? When's that damn thing going to go on? Is it time yet? I, it's not working. It's broken. You peek at it. <laughs> oh, it's still yeah. Time is still going. Oh, shit. You know, it's back. <laughs> so you're actually just sitting there playing with time, but the sitting is timeless. Time is just the ticker tape running in the head, you see. In an air culture, that's where we live. We live in the ticker tape of time, past and future. Nobody, very few people live now, except in their art or their extreme sport or their drug or something. We go, usually at great expense, to get to timeless places in our life. Uh, go to an amusement park, you get on a roller coaster, there's no time on a roller coaster. See? Or you go to a good movie, there's no time in the movie. You come out and you say, oh my God, I got up late. You know, you're back in time. In the movie, if it's good, no time. Uh, or you get involved with a friend and you, you know, or knitting. There was a knitting class in here. And she said, oh, knitting is very meditative. What does that mean? There's no time in knitting. Does anybody here knit? If you really, you know, it's a meditation. So that you 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 get into the knitting and time the weary mind dissolves, you see. And you just become very it's a very peaceful place to go. So a lot of people carry their knitting around with them. You know, obviously you're not knitting, right? No. <laughs> I'm here. Right. Yeah. But even so, people will I know you see people who will bring their knitting. Yeah. Because they might be in a meeting or something. It's like nursing a baby. You know, you go <laughs> pull that knitting out, you know, because it brings you peace. It takes you out of time. Time is worry. But the only function of time is worry, because worry is all about time. I, I put this up because the, they were sitting here knitting, and when they were knitting, I was thinking of uh, Penelope in the Odyssey. Do any of you familiar with the Greek life. myth? Yeah. On the Odyssey, and Penelope was the queen of Ithaca, and Odysseus was in the war, and he was trying to get back. And, uh, she had to hold off. Nobody knew if he was alive or not. She had to hold off the suitors because the queen had to have a king. So they were all one knocking on her door to be the suitors. So she held them off by saying, I'll, I'll pick one of you guys when I finish this sweater or something. 
So she knitted the sweater during the, I don't know what it was, a shawl or something. Knitted it during the day, but unraveled it at night. <laughs> so she was always knitting a sweater, and she never had to pick any of these. So Odysseus came back, and she recalled he, came, he appeared as a beggar in this big dining hall for the suitors, and there was a bow there, the Odysseus bow. And if anybody could string that, they would be Odysseus. So, so nobody could string it. So he walked, the old beggar walked up, ah, hey, you can't you know, try that. So, he picked up the ball and strung it and shot him on it. <laughs> so anyway, but that, uh, but that whole that came to me. Well, in here, the, the knitting, unraveling knitting in the day and unraveling at night. Uh, yeah. I have a funny story. Okay. I studied Ulysses. Yes. Rosy finger Dawn. Yes. So the whole book I read, her name was Penelope. So they had the exam, and she's asking the questions for Penelope. Uh -huh. I had no idea. Who is that? But I could have written a whole book on oh, Penelope. <laughs> so I, I guess the reason I'm tying this in is because knitting, uh, the idea of uh, Knitting during the day, unraveling at night. This is a mythological. We find this in a lot of stories, but it's it's a metaphor for the for the world or the goddess. The goddess in mythology is is the physical world. The goddess in mythology is the world of this the physical world, and the physical world is a world of waxing and waning. Warping and woofing, up and down, positive and negative. It's, it's the physical world of giving and taking. Uh, did any of you see the life of Pi? Yeah. Well, there was an island on there, the Carnivorous Island. And when, when Pi left the island, he said the island, what the island gives during the day, it takes away at night. So what life gives, the life of the world gives during the day, it takes it away. So you get a little juice from this thing, you get a little money from this, but this will take it away. So the world, the physical world of phenomena, the form, is we're experiencing it as broken. We experience it as, I want to get the positive, without any bad. Our whole culture works like that. You, know, you, want to get, you want to get the good, you want to don't get the bad. So we go for the positive and we avoid the negative. But mathematically, you have zero and you have minus here, one, two, three, Four, one, two, three, four. You have zero, and you have negatives going this way, and you have negatives going that way. Zero is is the whole. Zero contains all of the negatives going that way towards infinity, and all of the positives going that way. But in the in the Hurt Locker, us as Hedwig, Hedwig is trying to get just the positive and no negative. So he's going in this direction. Our culture is always going towards the future. You see, time. The positive is tomorrow. I gotta get to it. I gotta do this. What do I have to do to get to that? But the negative is included in it because zero. So every moment now, hope you all follow me, because <laughs> I'm winging it right now. <laughs> now, the moment is, now is always zero. But when thinking comes in, we start thinking about, oh, this moment is crap. I want to be there. <laughs> you know? Or well, this moment is really great. It's better than yesterday. But it soon turns bad. So whatever we Whatever we're doing now, we're either seeing it as positive or negative and wanting to fix it. Get away from it, 
and be better or hold on to it. If it's a good moment, we cling to it, and, time try, and the world tries to take it away, or we try to leave it and get to it, and it follows us. Because we're always zero. So we're always, fundamentally, in reality, in balance and already whole, but we believe we are not. So we're believed then that we are, we have an angry inch. <laughs> you see, we believe there's a pain in there. There's a pain for wholeness that we try to heal by getting to something or someone or getting away from something or something, you see. But the truth of it, the truth of this teaching is that reality, that now, is always ground zero. So it, nature is always in balance. Nature is not, out, the universe is not out of balance, even though we, we perceive it to be out of balance. It's not. The universe is in balance, otherwise it would explode. So the universe is a balance of all the energies in the whole cosmos are all balanced. But as it changes, Buddha's main teaching is that reality is impermanent. Right? Reality is impermanent, which means reality is change. So if reality is change, but reality is always in balance, then reality, or nature, is balancing itself as it changes. So this is kind of like riding a bike. When you learn to ride a bike, you balance as the bike moves. You don't balance here, and then the bike moves and you fall off. Which is what kids try, you know, when you first learn, you know, so you learn to balance on the move. So whatever terrain you're running over, whether you're going up or down, you learn how to maintain balance, you see, in that new situation. So life is changing, so there are always new situations. And this practice is learning how to balance in no matter what happens to you. So if the doctor calls up and says you've got a lump, how do you maintain your balance in that new terrain? So how do you maintain your peace and your balance and your joy in a life that's changing? Because most people see it as, well, I can, I got to hold on to a little piece of it here and be satisfied with that, but life is going to be, it's going to throw you off, you see. It's going to, something's going to happen, it's going to, something's going to break down, <laughs> somebody's going to die, somebody, something's going to happen, uh, and, you have to re, and you have to regain your balance. So where do you go when you get thrown off of life, you see? Well, this practice is creating a zero, which is meditation. It's nothing. <laughs> meditation is absolutely nothing. It's zero. There's nothing in it for you. But it's a, it's a sitting where you sit in zero and regain your balance. Uh, okay, let me, uh, let's listen to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Yoga Nidra one on, on feeling. Uh, so let's uh, just relax a minute and digest this, and uh, I'll put the, uh, put the Yoga Nidra on, and then we'll uh, see how we can fit that into, fit, balance that with this. Did you notice anything in this uh, instruction with uh, ground zero? Yeah, comparing objects. You get comparing objects. Yeah. If, what, what, the way we connect this up is that now this, this present moment, 
that we are right now. We're always now. We're always this present moment. And the present moment is always balanced or zero. It's our thinking that makes it go this way or that. Positive, I want to get out of it. Negative, I got a positive, I want to hold it. I want this moment to last forever. Or negative, it's, I hate it, I got to get out of it. See, so that, that nausea, <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like being on a ship. It's going this way or that. So I want it to be still. And I want it to be balanced at peace, you know, like, you know, this is, the world is making me sick. <laughs> but literally, I mean, the, the world makes people sick. That's why they go off, shoot somebody. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, it's the world looking for balance when you don't know how to find it makes you sick. Uh, so basically what, what, what I, I know uh, as I did this, as I listen to this, I keep seeing more in it. And what he's doing here is giving us a basic formula for healing. But it's do it yourself. It's not like going to a witch doctor or going to a priest or going to a doctor to get Xanax or you know, get a Prozac or something. It's this is do it yourself healing. So how do you do it? Uh, well, it, it's so simple that we can't see it. But it takes the intention to apply the medicine to our world that we live in. So it takes the intention uh, to put the iodine on the wound or whatever, you know, just to use iodine. You know, and so, you know, you can't, so the wound is the angry itch. You know, so we all have an angry itch in there, some little irritation with the world, some pain, some problem that we can't get rid of, some thorn, some person, some situation, some belief, uh, some something is 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 irritating to me, and, and we don't know how to get rid of it. The more we try to get rid of it, the more it festers. You see, so we have to use the angry inch to get out of the hole. In other words, one way. So this one story about this uh, uh, explorer who got trapped in some ice and had no tool to chip his way out, so he used the turd <laughs> to dig his way out, you see. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, he, he took his angry inch and he dug out with his angry inch. So we have this teaching of, of the Buddha is basically how to use, that if the world is suffering, then you have to use your pain to get out of the pain. So how do you use pain to get free from pain? Yeah. But see, I found that hard when I started thinking about the angry hit. Yeah. Okay. Then my mind traveled to that. Yeah. Which became a negative. Well, okay. all right, so if we go back to this, this that was hard. go back to this this I feel, this, this is probably the one of the the best application in this yoga nidra uh, because he, he really it's something that's very portable I mean you can do this in Walmart and you can do it on the bus you can do it at home but basically you you have the intention to become aware of the feeling sensations in your body like warmth weight heaviness of warmth in my feet that's why I wear sandals all the time because I can feel my feet my feet are hot, you know, and I can feel, and when I walk, I'm very much aware of the heat and the weight and the feeling of my feet, you know. So I'm always, when I'm doing anything, I've trained, I've practiced so that I'm aware of my, I'm aware when I walk, I'm aware of the wind on my hands. Or if I'm outside, you can be aware of the sunlight on the side of your face. Uh, most of the time, we're just thinking, you see, we're just thinking about future, where I'm going, where I'm being, you know. So the whole practice is 
come back to ground zero. Ground zero is now, and where is now? Well, now is what I'm feeling. My thought, you know, my my body. You're getting back to your touch, you know, the massage. You know, when somebody touches you, you really like it. Well, this is touch yourself. <laughs> you know, in the sense that when you do this practice, I mean, you are your awareness is touching your living body. You know, the living body that uh, is very neglected by thinking. The living body is like the wife whose husband, which is thinking, never talks to her. Thinking is always off somewhere in time, running from this or trying to get to that. And the body is saying, hey, what about me? I'm, I, I'm your life, you know? So thinking is going, oh, well, you know, I'll get around to you. And I've got more important things to do. Yeah. Is our ground of being the yeah, ground zero. zero? Yeah, it's another word for it, yeah. So ground zero is now, and ground zero is always in balance, because now is the whole cosmos. But it's a moving show. It's not a static show. It's a moving show, you see. So it's always moving in balance, like I said earlier in the back. So now how do we get in balance by this practice? Well, you have to pick something. You have to pick something to play with. Uh, um, you gotta, you, you gotta have some. You gotta, if you're a child, you gotta have a toy or a teddy bear. You know, something to form. You have, to have some form that you can work with. So the form in this particular application is sensations in your feelings in your body, warm and cool, uh, heavy and light. Uh, relaxed and anxious, like is there part of your body that's a little restless or irritated or maybe you've got grumblings in the stomach or something, you know, or, or maybe there's a part that feels, uh, and there's another part that's a little tense, you see. So you kind of like becoming very still and aware of these, and then you play with it. So now you just, and it, and it takes practice, you can't just jump into this, it takes practice. So then you become aware of a feeling of warmth. And then you become aware of a feeling of coolness, back and forth. So you're playing with it. And all the time, your mind is coming in there trying to take you off, say, this is stupid. You've got other things to think about, you see. So that you can become aware of your intention to be aware of your inner body and thinking coming in and saying, wait a minute, what about me? So now you've reversed the situation. Before, you were thinking like the husband and the body is the wife saying, you never talk to me. You say, you never listen to me. And now you're saying, well, I'm listening to you. And the thinking is saying, wait a minute, what about me? <laughs> what about all the important things you've got to think about, you see? So you're kind of like flipping the thing. And uh, as you play with this, uh, oh, and then he says, basically, put the negative and the positive together. And, and then he says, you can't do it with thought. In other words, you can't, uh, because it's not logical. This, if, if I say, well, here's a marker, and here's a speaker, and now I want to make them, put them together, make them one. Well, I can't do it. This, the marker is the marker, the speaker is the speaker, and I can't make them one. If you were angry about, like, I was thinking would be angry. Yeah. I, I thought of something that made me angry this morning. Right. I vocalized it. How about somebody else, not my husband? But yes. <laughs> but anyway, at the same time then, I was trying to go the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Now, as you say, you can't put them together. Do you, uh, I mean, do you just wipe that negative out of your mind? Or do you think about what would be the positive thing that would negate the negative? Okay, well, what you're describing there, he said you can't do. You can't do it then. Because what he said was, all right, try to put, all right, let's use that again. I got the anger with my neighbor. I mean, I've got an actual, I just had it, you know, something like that. You know, I can feel that thing. I can bring up his picture and I got it. Yeah. Then he says, separate the feeling yeah. from the story. So I want to just feel the feeling of anger okay. without its cause, which is my neighbor. Okay. All right. So I just forget the neighbor, forget the story. What's real is the feeling. Now I go find a feeling of being relaxed or at peace. 
maybe I, uh, well, I could even imagine what would it be like if I wasn't angry. In other words, find its opposite. And then you go back, and you go back and forth like that. And then he said, now, now, try to put them together, but you can't do it by effort, which is willpower or thought. So this is bringing you to the point of frustration where you just relax with both of them like, simultaneously. And so basically this is a creating a frustration that drives you to the point where you give up trying and something happens. So when you're holding, if you're when you're holding hot and cold together, or anger and peace, okay, anger and peace, these are opposites. But so if you if you find a situation, a real feeling of anger. And then a feeling of peace, so relax, and go back and forth. You're dis you first of all you're disconnecting from the story, and the story is the cause. Now see, this this is very important because when we have anger, we say somebody this it's painful or it's irritation or anger, it's painful. And then we say, well, I want to get rid of it, right? I mean, that's a negative. I want to get rid of the negative. I want to get over here. So what's the cause of it? Well, the neighbor's the cause of it, or my husband, or my wife, or the dog, or something, or my kidney, <laughs> or the world situation, or whatever. We believe there's a cause to it. So now I can't get rid of the anger because it is connected, you see, to a believed cause for the anger. But it's my anger. You see, it's the anger, the feeling is now, the cause is in my mind, in the past. But the past only exists in my mind. So I have connected my now feeling with a past cause. It might have happened yesterday, or two minutes ago, or last year, or my childhood. But the cause, my feeling now, is tied to the past, which doesn't exist. I can't get to that. I can't go in the past and change the past so I'm not angry now. But I want to, you see? So this is the trap. So I want to go, I want to time travel <laughs> into the past and fix my mother so that I don't feel screwed up today. <laughs> right? But you can't do that. So now I'm stuck because I had misplaced the cause of my anger and put it in the past that is dead. And we, we live that way. This what it continues? What the cause continues? It continues because we believe in its cause. And so the next time we see the cause, we project the past pain onto that, and we need it coming. So what we need is not this individual innocently in the present as they are. What we're needing is our past projected on, coming back at us, and I already need it with a grievance. I want to fix you for getting me in the past, you see. And they say, I didn't do anything. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then they get angry, and now you've, now you've caused a pain in them, so now they need you with a grievance from the past. And you're meeting them from a grievance in the past, and it's just like that, you see. So this, this whole practice is giving us the application to break the chain and just allow the feeling to be a feeling without its connection to the past. And then we can dissolve the pain by, by coming up with its opposite and then holding them together and that brings us to ground zero. And there's no pain in ground zero because it's balanced. Does that make sense to you? Yes. <laughs> But the, yeah. Um, during this practice, Leafy said something about um, 
where do you feel yeah. the pain? Where do I feel? Yeah. And so I felt anger or pain yeah. or whatever in my stomach. Yeah. But I felt the peace in my chest. Yeah. Yeah. And so in my heart, yeah. And so I believe what I was able to do um, not getting rid of the story, the feeling of peace calmed the stomach. Yeah. It just kind of, I mean, I didn't go deep into it because yeah. the, the idea, the story yeah. is so far removed from me now yeah. that I, mean, I don't go deep into it, but I can still feel it yeah. flip my stomach. Yeah. Right? Well, that, see, that has, there's a lot of wisdom in that for you. Because if, if it's still there, there's still, it's like, you know, my mother, you know, mother say, eat everything on your plate. <laughs> you don't leave any leftovers. Well, that's a leftover. Right. You see, that's some leftovers down there. Right. Uh, that you can, with, the, with this understanding, uh, give it the freedom and the protection to come up. You see, it's okay to come up. You know, it's okay for this feeling to be here. And when you let it, you relax and you let it up, uh, you'll discover that the energy that it has contained, because it is energy, but it's trapped energy, trapped in the past. Zombies or whatever, movies are full of it. You know, the whole idea of burying somebody in the, you know, and they're buried and you can't get out. Well, this is our past pain that is buried in our mind that we won't let out uh, because it's painful <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we don't feel safe, we feel vulnerable. So by, by this meditation, we relax and let what is there come up. And so it, when it comes up, it's like here's conscious and here's, say, unconscious. Here we have pain, and it's like an iceberg it comes up like that. So you got a little bitty angry inch here, of pain, and you say, "What is that? You know, what? You know, what? What is that little irritation there? And, you know, when you start relaxing with it uh, and allowing it to appear, and gradually this big iceberg appears, but it melts. See, this is awareness." When you allow it to come up in your awareness without of trying to avoid it or fight it or fix it or run from it or hate it or blame it or whatever, you just allow it to be there, it melts because it is you. But it's you, your awareness that has been packed in ice, in the pain of ice, buried down there. And uh, when we allow it up in a safe place like this practice, it melts, and that energy that was caught in there is now free. And guess where it goes? It becomes joy and creativity, and energy to clean the house or start a new project, or make up with a friend, or just feel great. <laughs> you see, because it's, it's, it doesn't go away, it's you. But it's liberated you. So this practice is gradually uh, uh, freeing ourselves from the pain of our past. Uh, smoking my first joint, you know, and I thought everybody's saying it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. So I said, well, this is good. <laughs> so this practice is kind of like that. Is when you discover that you can actually do something with it, it becomes very good. And then that energy strengthens your attention so that you begin to do it all the time, you see, uh, and you begin to move faster in it, uh, and you feel better and better, and you get feeling healthier and healthier, and you have reversed the aging process. So, so uh, the Buddha said when he, when he came out of his pleasure palace, which is the fragmented world, and he saw old age, sickness, and death, it was an existential encounter 
with his own immortality or death. So he said, well, what good is anything in life if everything is impermanent? If everything dies, what good is anything? So he set out to find the uh, truth of impermanence or freedom from old age, sickness, and death. Not the fact that the body actually is dominates, but liberation from the pain of old age, sickness, and death, which basically is the pain of impermanence. And what he discovered was ground zero, basically. Um, which is the symbol, meditation. See, so meditation is ground zero. See, so because it's good for absolutely nothing. <laughs> and that's the whole point of it. You know, if it was good for something, it would be like, I can use that to get somewhere and be better than I am now. But meditation is basically saying, I'm no better than I am now. I'm never going to be any better than I am right now. You see? So it completely flips our attempt to get out of now by saying, I'm here. Get used to it. <laughs> and something begins to happen that we didn't believe could happen because we've always been trying to get out of that. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I really, I, I, I'm speaking from uh, my own life experience um, because, um, well, right now I'm going through, uh, and, and I guess it's, it, it kind of like metaphor. It seems to be part of my own life, but. Uh, my uncle died and left the little money, so we have a uh, new kitchen. You know, they, and then we're having the yard landscape, so we have a professional design coming in. And I uh, had some painting done. And uh, so the house has been reborn. You know, it was the house was uh, uh, built in 1903. So it's over 100 years old. Nothing has ever really been integrating. Nothing has really, it's always been renters and my, my wife's mother, my wife grew up in the house, then my wife's father died, her mother had to move to Norfolk because of a job, sold the house, she retired, came back to Blackstone, house came up for sale, she bought the house back. So, uh, so in between, a lot of different people have worked on it and done this and botched that and, uh, <laughs> and you know, so it was just a mess. Uh, and so, Fortune has smiled on me to the point, you know, that gradually we've been able to uh, uh, re restore the house. And, and with this Michael's money that he left, uh, uh, we've been able to integrate the kitchen, which used to be just a hodgepodge of cabinets, cabinets that people brought. You know, we found this in the junkyard and put that up in that kind of a kitchen. So now it's totally, the whole kitchen is customized for that particular space. So it's all integrated. So you walk in there and everything is home. It's a, nice, it's a nice feeling when you walk into a home or a place. Or this is where Apple became so successful. So it's, it's, there is a connection that we feel when we engage with some form that is whole or integrated, where everything fits. When you go into somebody's house and you say, Oh, you're not quite sure why, but everything fits. You know, the flowers, the, the way the furniture is, uh, everything, the, the you know, style. And so this landscaper that's doing the yard, I'm really happy with her work because everything fits. <laughs> you know, she's got the tall plants and the short plants and the space right and this and the walkway. And the, so you, well, oh, oh, you know, so there's this feeling of, there's, there's a wholeness here, you know, or in nature. You know, when you're in a natural scene where the sky and the water and the mountains or whatever, just everything just everything just fits. It's that feeling of ground zero. <laughs> so 
So we're constantly coming upon ground zero where everything, there is no leaning one way or the other. You know, it's just, ah, here, you see. And the point of this teaching is that that ground zero is always present within us. It's not in time, or it's not in the good old days. Now it's crap, you see, the good old days are gone. Or I gotta get to it, but it's always now. But our culture conditions us to look for it in the future or long for it in the past. And we just walk right over ground zero all the time, you see, trying to get out of it. Is, is ground zero going to when you need to, when something's bothering you, you need to meditate, so you meditate it all, but then you bring it back to ground zero? No, ground zero is meditation. In other words, the, the sitting, say if you, you, you set your clock for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 15, whatever, and that, you know, so your intention is to sit in this nothing, this zero here, and just focus, put your attention on your breath. So you just relax and just put your attention on the breath, and you and you release you 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 release the effort of the mind to fix anything or to get out of anything. So, so you just like I quit. <laughs> you know, but it's or, not fixed though. It well, can become as well. Yeah. So so you, meditation comes about. Ground zero comes about when you realize that you can't fix the world. You can't fix your mind. You can't do you think, do you fix the issues that you're doing? You can't fix the issues or anything. You can you can improve something, but it's all it's not going to last. See what that's what I mean. Everything is impermanent. So you get a brief little moment of oh, I think everything is ready. I got all my bills paid. I got rid of that problem and all that. Bam, something else happens, you see. Oh, I'm back in it, you know. So you never arrive. No, okay. You know what I mean? So we believe we will, but experience shows us that you never get to permanent peace. And then so most people say, well, life is suffering, get out with it, I'll be permanent peace when I'm dead. You know, so you put it off, you say, I give up on life. <laughs> I'll wait, you know. But but that, you know, so then then you're uh, you know, so that's a whole other story. But that but this is interesting. What this point of view is that there's only now, there is no tomorrow, there's always now, and that the peace you're looking for is now, and you can find it if you give up looking for it. Okay. And it's a paradox, you see, because we're taught from childhood that you've got to put effort into fixing the world so it's peaceful. So this, this practice goes against the grain. It goes against our culture, uh, which is flowing this way in time. America is future-oriented. The better world to come. Our parents, our children are going to live better than us. Uh, my kids are going to have more money than me. We're going, to make, we're going to make the world peaceful. We're going to get rid of this and all that. And we're moving towards that. You see, the American dream. So we're just like conditioned to think in terms of Explore, going west, the east is too crowded. We're going to go to California. You know that whole idea. The America is restless and it's future orientated. Uh, other cultures aren't like that. Um, you know, you go to Europe. I, have, I don't know if any of you travel to Europe, but I, I travel on the uh, Discovery. Not the Discovery. Yeah, you know, the, the travel DVD. You know, so that's where I travel. And uh, but you'll notice that uh, that in Europe. There seems to be an integration of services and humanity now that they, they've gotten over the world wars. Mm -hmm. Germany has finally come to rest. Uh, and uh, they got the communists out of, you know, so all the countries now are part of one union. And you watch these travel things and they get on, you get on the subways, you get on the train in Denmark and you go, you can go all over and it's all integrated and it's in English and you push the button and you take this. And it's just like one big Disneyland, <laughs> you know, in the sense that uh, everybody you can go everywhere. It's all the one money, and it's very intelligent. It looks like, you know, and they, uh, you know, they, they, they have a different value system. There seems to be more of a, 
uh, of an integration of now rather than we got to get to tomorrow. So the, so we don't invest anything in now. We've got we got to get to tomorrow. But there seems to be just a different way of looking at life there. And then and then other cultures are always different. But America is very much driven towards uh, future. Uh, and and here we are in the future, having lived the first half of our life uh, to get here. So we'll be totally at peace, playing golf and sitting on a yacht, or surrounded by loving grandchildren, or whatever the vision was, you see. Uh, and it's still now. <laughs> Is it like satisfaction? Satisfaction, content, contentment with the now means I am not disturbed by what happens. The world no longer disturbs me and makes me irritated because it isn't the way it's supposed to be. The work, the work, my marriage, my wedding, my marriage, uh, with, with your spouse or with your family, uh, most of the strife comes because they're not the way they're supposed to be or you think they should be or you want them to be for their own good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that creates a leaning towards the positive. I can imagine them being better, but right now they're miserable, you see. So I'm miserable, I'm upset with them now, and I want them to be like a 10, <laughs> you see. Or they, and then they get mad at you, and now they're a negative. Now they're painful and hurtful, you see. Um, but all of it is basically not accepting, welcoming, not welcoming now. So this practice is all about welcoming every perception as a guide to your ground zero, or your ground, your central ground of being, which he calls it, or presence, the different names. Uh, so we keep working around them, but, but coming back to this now, which means accepting this moment, even if I've got cancer, I'm accepting that as not being able, it is not able to be different than it is. The universe cannot be different than it is right now. I can imagine it, but it can't be. This is it. The whole cosmos, you see, the Earth, the, our, our solar system, the galaxies, the whole Big Bang <laughs> that we can't even imagine. The whole Big Bang is all interrelated and is all part of now. So now is the Big Bang. The Big Bang is not in the past. It's still going on. God's creation is not in the past. It's going on now. You see. Now is, if you want to use a religious term, now is God creating himself as us, or the Big Bang is going on creating itself now, but it's not something that started in the past, it's something that is happening now, and we are in it. We're not outside of it, it's not like we're aliens, the universe is created here, and we're outside of it, you see, you know, oh, look at that, you know, we're in it, <laughs> and we're in it is now. Something. I'm trying to put this all together. You say that all of us should be living in the now. Well, we are in the now, whether right. we like it or not. Right. <laughs> so, what happens if that was true? It is true. Go ahead. I, I'm trying. I can't say, seem to think how I can say this to you. Yeah. But if people didn't think about the future, if people didn't decide, well, guess what? I think I'm going to get away from the East Coast and go out west. Well, they're, they're thinking about the future. Or Edison didn't think about the future, and we don't have. I mean, that doesn't. I can't. Okay, let's some I'm people, glad you brought that up. Okay, because that's a big problem people have. Because they, well, then does that mean you just do nothing and just right. sit there? Right. Right. No. Um, so there's two causes. All right. So if I want to make myself better, or I want to improve the world or I want to have meaning, or I want to have something that will enhance my life, then I'm going to have a program, or I'm going to 
a plan or a strategy, I'm going to make some effort to do that. Okay? But that's based on a need to be better than I am. Or make the world better than it is. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what, what we're looking at here is what would happen if you relaxed that effort, realizing that you can't make the cosmos better than it is. If you can't make the universe better than it is, well, the next world, what's the point of doing anything? Well, that's not, that, that's not it. Because if we will relax the effort to make my, and, and by the universe I mean me too, I'm included in that. It's not like I want to make the universe better without me. See, I am the universe, so if I'm making the world better, I'm making me better, because I am the world and me is one. I'm not going to be off in space somewhere while I've made the world better, and I'm not even affected, you see. I'm included in that. So that is based on a need or a sense of incompleteness, or I'd be happier, or I'd be more complete, or getting back to the angry inch, I'll be whole if I can fix this fragmented world with my plan. So now I'm going to fly my plan and see if I can fix the world, if I can remove hunger, or if I can uh, fix my neighbor, or if I can uh, fix my daughter, or fix some family member. Or I got an alcoholic. I'm saying, you see what I mean? So I had a son who was an alcoholic and uh, came back to live with us and, uh, uh, from California. And uh, so I was in, so he was, uh, he, would just, he, was, he was not what you call a, a, a social drinker. I mean, he would, he would drink to oblivion, you know, like he would go out and get a bottle and chug it and then pass out. You know, just I want out of the world. It's the, the world is so painful, I want out. So that was his means of getting out. So I went through all of my strategies as a father to fix it because it was painful and it shouldn't be that way. You know, so I tried to uh, get kick out. I tried you know, all the, the strategies and nothing worked. So finally it, he taught me that he was okay whether he was drunk or sober. I, mean, I didn't support his drinking, like, you know, well, you know, here, have a bottle. But if he was drunk, and there's my only son, you know, just a drunken mess, uh, I still loved him as much as I did when he was sober and clean and optimistic. You know? So there was this two opposites, you see? The good son and the bad son. Most people will just love the good part. I want you to be good all the time. Get rid of that drunken part of you. <laughs> so what can we do to fix it so you'll be good all the time? But he is both. He's whole. He's drunk and sober. And all I wanted to do was to cut the sober part, cut the drunk part off, and make him sober all the time. And he couldn't do it because he was drunk and sober. You see, you can't cut the positive away from the negative because they're one. It's like a magnet. If you cut the positive pole off of a magnet, you just have a shorter magnet, but it's still got a positive and negative pole. So you chop it off again. You're trying to get the positive side, but the negative is always there, you see. So with drunk and sober, you try to fix the sober side, but the negative side is always there. If he's sober for a while, the negative side pulls him back because that's whole. So I, I don't know if this had anything to do with it or not, but I, I realized that he was, I, he was okay with me, whether he was drooling on the floor or drunk. Either way. And so I created the conditions where the self-hate the, the self that he had for himself was able to uh, be accepted See, the problem is that, that a person feels themselves unworthy, and the parent feels themselves unworthy because their behavior is unworthy. They, their, their feeling is, I'm not worthy, you see, because uh, the parent does not love my unworthy behavior, but I am that behavior, so I can't get out of it. So they're trapped, you see. Both are trapped in that. 
trying to try not neither one is a, a, able to accept both sides at the same time. So you look at this practice. Go find a warm feeling. Go find a drunk feeling. Go find a sober feeling. Using a metaphor. Now put them together as whole, you see. see. So when I put my son together as drunk and sober, the healing began to, something began to happen. He found a girlfriend that loved him, drunk or sober, and the drunkness fell off. So he didn't have to go to, uh, he didn't have to go to AA and hang out with sponsors and, oh, don't, I don't, can't see any alcohol. <laughs> oh, I'm going somewhere where this, somebody's going to drink. Oh my God, will I fall back? It just fell off. So that's been about four years. Uh, he's got a full-time job. He's got, he plays in a band. He's got a full-time job with a graphic designer. Uh, he's engaged. His girlfriend uh, uh, has uh, two little girls, so he's a father. And he's got a whole life, you see. And um, he's a late bloomer. He's 44. Um, so he spent about uh, most of the previous life, you know, trying to get, trying to get out of, the, of this angry edge. And the, the unconditional love that the Bible talks about, you see, is accepting both sides at the same time. Conditional love means I just love the positive side of you and I hate the negative. So Christians say this, oh, I love the God side of you, but I hate the sinful side. And God hates that, you see. So God hates the drunk and loves the sober God. But that's not unconditional love. That's conditioned on well, the fact that you just remain positive and get rid of the negative. Yeah. But, okay, so the unconditional love—it's like you accept, you accept, accept him. The girlfriend accepted him. Like it is what it is, kind of thing. Yeah. But you didn't enable him. Well, she put pressure on him. Yeah. I mean, she reached the point where uh, it's the love. So there was that ingredient too. I couldn't do that. Um, a lot of people told me, said, well, kick the bum out, you know, put him out on the street and his stuff in a, in a garbage bag, let him live out of, the, out of the dumpster. You know, so that was hard, you know, hard luck, you know. Uh, one friend had a couple of and that's what they did, you know, and he finally came around or whatever. But uh, that wasn't in my nature. Uh, so that, that wasn't a heartfelt option. I, I could do it if somebody else told me to do it, but I couldn't do it because somebody else said that's what I should do. I had to do what, what my heart said to do. Uh, and that really didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Do we practice unconditional love on ourselves? Yes, exactly. That unconditional love is, loud, is, is finding the opposites in our nature and allowing both of them to be together as mates. It's getting positive and negative married again. It's getting divorced parents back together. Because we get divorced when we seek the positive and try to get rid of and repress the negative or fight it or get rid of it. So if the neighbor picks and puts a fence up and ticks you off, you know, treats you unkindly, then that's caused you some pain and you blame the neighbor. But there is only one world. So when I blame the other person for my pain, I have split the world into a negative, and, and it should be different. It should not have done that to me, you see. So I have split the world, but I perceive it as being something external causing pain to me, when in reality, I'm causing my own pain. You see, but I don't see that. So when I relax, I realize that the feeling I have, the anger I have for the other person is me. It's not them. The anger is me. And when I see that, it's kind of like uh, if, if this was a stove and this was a hot burner, and maybe I was blind, you know, and I put my hand on it and I say, uh, whoa, something is really causing me pain. You know, you know, I'm really, you know, what is this? You know, I'm really causing me pain. And so suddenly the lights come on. When I see that my hand is on the burner, I don't have to say, oh, my hand's on the burner, I think I'll take it off. The seeing 
takes the hand, the seeing and the action is one. You see, the seeing that I'm causing, the seeing that I'm stabbing myself is, is stops the action. So the seeing that the anger I believe someone else has caused me, the seeing that the anger is me, that I'm causing it by the way I'm perceiving the situation, uh, stops the pain. And then something new, a creative, is allowed to happen that heals the situation. So you do something unexpected that you couldn't do when we were reacting. You see, so what we're, this coming together of opposites is a creative action. When opposites come together, something, it generates the energy. It's like Boy Scouts with sticks and you're creating fire. You're rubbing two opposites together to create fire. So when you rub two opposites together, you create creative energy or compassion. And compassion then tells you what to do. You don't have to worry. Compassion will tell you what to do next. When before, it was just, what should I try this and try that? The willpower. You know, so this, the, the compassion is the action of the heart that is always in unity with reality. The mind is always fragmented into me and it, you see. So the mind is always operating from me and an other, and the heart is always operating from us and unity. But when the heart acts, when the heart acts, it's compassion. When the mind acts, it's reaction. Anyway, we're past our time. Thank you for uh, your, your listening, your, your listening and attention. Your